big show, especially because it's a show. So I had to experiment with color and different textures, and it's something that I've never had to do before because previously I had to work with less intense colors where for this show I had to overcome my fear of color and adopt a more mindset, if you will, um, meaning like more color, more vibrancy, more anything just to fill the space and make it feel very full and just fill it with something that felt like an undersea lavish life for the actors to explore it. The skill of the show was huge and so we had to learn a lot of new skills like and grow a lot of skills like time management, um, problem solving, leadership. Um, for costumes, this was the first show we ever had like people constantly changing costumes and so we had to learn a new system, make a new system and then learn how to navigate through that system and make like oh this worked for us this today. Um, we are currently working on our next production William Shakespeare's Up in Summer Night's Dream. It's a comedy, and we open tomorrow night at 7. Um, I hope to see you all there. During SpongeBob, I was an assistant stage manager. Now in Midsummer, I'm a lighting leader. So I was inspired to join, join lighting because I learned a lot of skills from SpongeBob, and I wanted to gain and grow some more. But when I joined lighting, I really had no idea what I was doing. Nonetheless, our director didn't hold my hand and tell me exactly how to do it and exactly what to do. He let me learn with my team and we grew. I learned how to cut lights, I learned how to focus lights, I learned how to blend lights, I learned how to create different settings, moods and tones with just changing the back lights alone. And I also learned how to adapt to my circumstances. I learned how to lead others while also teaching the content myself. And that is a valuable skill that I think I can take into any career. During um, midsummer, I wanted to take a new perspective because the in Throughout theater, I've been challenging myself to just try new things, take down different perspectives, and learn different aspects of what theater is and what it takes to be in a production. So for this time around, I decided to act for the first time, and considering I have quite stage fright, it's certainly a different experience. But it's been fun, and I enjoy the challenge, and it's really interesting to see the different kinds of work that has to be put in to be an actor versus if I was in tech still, and still doing lighting or what it would take to, you know, just bring the production together in all the aspects that it takes for everyone to work together as a team to make something so completely beautiful that we all put our hearts into it. Overall, theater has allowed us to gain a number of skills and grow as people. We learned leadership skills, responsibility, teamwork, and creating communities, and that's only a fraction of what we've done. But these skills are not only helpful in the arts, but in any career we want to take them into. We've seen the success of our program in the achievements of two of our officers. Uh, at Colorado Thespian Conference this year, I presented my stage manager at work from SpongeBob and talked a lot about how I grew as a person and a leader through theater. <clears throat> there, I won the Dr. J. Sellers Scholarship for Design Tech. And uh, I've also recently committed to Rowan University, where I will be studying as a theater major with a focus on design tech and stage management. Thanks. And uh, this year, I was chosen to be a state thespian officer, which um, basically means that I would be doing a lot of event planning for advocacy of the arts, just like this board meeting here, or uh, help planning uh, the Colorado State Thespian Conference. Also doing some community outreach, fundraising, and overall just taking my leadership skills statewide and as well as learning from others. I want to thank you for your time and your support, and we hope to see you at our show this weekend. <laughs> I uh, understand that um, some of you could maybe do a monologue. Mm -hmm. oh. that, can we get a little example? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. When my cue comes, call me and I will answer. My next is a uh, most fair pyramus. Hey, you, Peter Quince, Boot the Bellas Mender, Stomp the Tinker, Starveling, God's my life stolen hence and left me asleep. I have had the most rare vision. I have had a dream past the way of man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if he goes about to expound this dream. We thought I was 
But there's no man can tell what. He thought I was, and he thought I had. But man is but a patch fool if you'll offer to say what we thought I had. The eye of man hath not heard. The ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand not able to taste, tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what this dream was. I'll get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream, and it shall be called Bottoms Dream, because it hath no bottom, and I shall sing in the latter end of a play before the Duke. Her adventure, to make it more gracious, I shall sing it at her death. Do you have any more questions for us? Yeah. Well, I'm just curious. I'm sorry. <laughs> just trying to find the time I can go. <laughs> um, our, our show times so um, this Thursday through Saturday are going to be at 7 p.m., and on Sunday it's going to be at 2 p.m. What exactly is involved in being a stage manager? Stage management is a lot of communication and knowing where everyone's mind is at. So we take stage managers take the production concept that the director gives us and our knowledge of what the actors know and what the actors are capable of and what we can push them to do, as well as the capabilities and um, possibilities for all of our stage crew and our design crews all throughout. Uh, we work a lot with uh, getting our blocking notes done, so we have uh, documentation of where everyone is at every like, moment in the show, and use that to communicate with our props crew of this is where things need to go, and our lighting crew of this is where people need to be lit up, and it's a lot of making sure we know where things are supposed to be and getting that to happen. <laughs> and it's, uh, I've learned a lot of like calm communication because we're a big example of how everyone else is handling the stressful situations. And uh, it's, yeah, it's a lot of just how, is, how are things working and how can we make them work better. You actually call the shows as a stage manager? Um, I did, yeah. So stage managers call shows. I've also been an assistant stage manager and I'm currently an assistant stage manager. So assistant stage managers are running. Uh, backstage and make sure that everything backstage is running smoothly while state vendors are calling them. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really bummed though. I really wanted to hear Patrick or SpongeBob monologue. <laughs> 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 Patrick, oh, okay. <laughs> Patrick is not here, but our SpongeBob is right there. Was it the best day ever? Uh, that's what he likes and so. Um, being in this field, uh, myself too. Thank you very much for doing this. Uh, I run a team myself, so um, I'm the uh, tech person that's in charge. So exactly what you go through every day and stress and calmness. That you, have to <laughs> you are the duck on the water. You can do your spinning. So thank you very much for all that. Thing. Uh, we do appreciate it, and because of that, uh, the Board of Education would seem to love to get the Thank you very much for that. Um, commitment to governing studies. The board will govern lawfully, observe the policy governance principles with an emphasis on the outward vision rather than in the internal preoccupation. Encouragement of diversity and viewpoint, strategic leadership more than administrative detail, clear distinction of board and chief executive roles, <laughs> collective rather than individual decisions, future rather than past or present, 
and governing uh, proactively rather than reactively. Could I get an approval of the agenda, please? I move to approve the agenda dated March 8, 2023, as presented. Do I hear a second? Second. Hearing it so moved by Director Thur uh, Thornton and then seconded by Director Khan. Could I give her um, uh, the, uh, a roll call, please? Director Khan. Aye. Director yes. Green. Thank you. Director Petrosky. Yes. Director Thomas. Aye. Director Thornton. Aye. Director Vito. Aye. Director Bird. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. All right. Student Advisory Council. Come on up. Tell us about all the things going on. More students. Yeah. Oh, we just oh, okay. um, well, good evening, uh, student, not student, <laughs> school board. Um, it's been a while since I've been here, and I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, well, just a little reminder my name is Diana Hernandez, and I'm a senior at Eagle Ridge Academy. I guess we can go down the line and just introduce ourselves again. Uh, hello, I'm Brian. Uh, you guys know me through all that. I'm with Brian, and I am a If you don't remember me, I don't have to be friends anymore. Um, <laughs> my name's Tyler Blunt, I'm a sophomore at the SAT school. I'm Zoe Ann McNeese, and I am a freshman at Online Academy. I'm Haley, and I'm a junior at Riverdale. I'm going to get his name back. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. Okay, um, you can go to the slides now. Oh, shoot. I am like, not paying attention. No, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Thank you, Diane. I'm going to get me scored away. Yes, I did not run away. <laughs> Um, so, um, recently, uh, the Student Advisory Board, uh, today, actually, it was LB and a couple of other Student Advisory Board members uh, recorded a podcast um, talking about uh, how counselor, counselor involvement um, within the big schools such as Brighton, Riverdale, and Prairie View um, have um, somewhat of complications um, trying to reach every student that needs help. Um, I unfortunately couldn't attend this podcast, but I do know that LB really wanted to like highlight how um, there's around two ranges in a student body. There's those students who have the straight A's who always seek for counselor help, and then there's those students who don't really rarely um, receive or look for that help due to um, the fact that they don't know that they have counselors. And then there's the middle where um, nobody like gets seen because um, there's so many students of big schools. So that's why um, LB and a couple of other students wanted to really touch on that. And um, if anyone else wants to speak on um, what they podcast. Oh, so I was uh, the other student on that podcast this morning, and I had a very similar concern about it seems like the top 2%, the top bottom percent, the ones who really uh, reach out to the counselors. Um, we interviewed my personal counselor at Brighton High School, uh, Ms. Jolene Chidi. Um, and it was a very insightful um, interview and meeting about their new studies to try to improve their outreach and connect with students uh, sooner and make sure they have plans for throughout their high school career and beyond high school as well in stretching and kind of breaking that gap of students who don't talk to them. And it definitely, personally for me at least, kind of gave me some hope for fixing that issue over time. A little bit of controversy with episode two, huh? Hey, okay, trying to draw the ratings, right? <laughs> you know, um, I think what just is really important to us at the moment is just having all those students have equal opportunity and being able to receive help and know when uh, to receive help and who to go to. So that's why um, the group wanted to, to really touch on uh, counselor help. Um, our counselors um, in this district are amazing. Um, they are doing the best job that they can, but with so many students, I, um, it's really hard for them to reach every student, um, especially if like a school has around 2,000 kids and so. Um, you can go to the next slide. Okay. 
It has been super long since our last meeting, um, but some quick updates. Uh, next week, we're going to have um, Wish Week to help uh, fundraise for Make-A-Wish um, for a child named Hugh. Um, this will involve a trivia night at a uh, Big Choice Brewery, um, a dodgeball tournament, a movie night, and a concert from our symphonic band where we'll be selling uh, flowers to help fundraise for uh, the foundation. Um, spring sports are recently starting up within the past two weeks. Um, that includes track, uh, women's golf, and a few others. Uh, Link and NHS are both uh, starting their recruitment processes for next year to try to get our next year and generation of students and officers. Um, as well as preparing for all our spring events. So NHS will have their charity week coming up in late March, I believe, uh, to fundraise for various charities. Um, it's a community-wide event. Um, anyone's willing to come, we have a board game night. Um, I believe we have a cakewalk night and a crafts night. And then Link is also planning a um, kind of spring uh, social event where it will just be mostly like crafts hanging out and just spring related activities. Uh, the first weekend of the musical was last week. Um, it went really, really well. Um, we're pretty happy with how opening night went. Uh, those were the two shows that our uh, Bobby G uh, interviewers came to. So we're pretty proud of how that went. Things we're, we're happy with the overall performance. We've got our last two shows this Friday and Saturday. Um, and then we're pretty much done for the rest of the year. So, both an exciting and somber time. Um, so, uh, tickets can be purchased ahead of time. Uh, the website uh, links will there. I also have some business cards with uh, all the additional information on it. And then, last but not least, construction. Not much is progressing on the outside and affecting students. It's just continuing steady on on the inside, doing the facing finishing the inside as you can kind of see in those photos. And yeah, any questions? Did they really go with the blue and bright and I, a bright eye? I believe that is just a remnant of construction. I do not believe that will be the final color. <laughs> I believe that's just an intermediate case. All right, let's do that. I'm getting worried. <laughs> I think it should be rock. Okay. <laughs> Better be red. All right, so um, for Eagle Ridge Academy, um, both our boys and girls basketball did go to state. Um, unfortunately, the girls did get knocked out the first round of state. Um, as you can see on the uh, lady your right, um, that, top, that picture on the top, that is me. Um, um, I uh, played basketball this year, and I've been playing for the past three years. And uh, knowing that this was my last time on court, it was a really special moment for me. So um, for the girls basketball team, uh, we really prioritized just bonding at that time. And we knew um, that the team that we were going to play was really high up in the level. So what we just did is just make sure um, we had our last laughs, our last tears on the court. And um, yeah, uh, the season ended pretty well. Um, and going to state was a really special moment for us. Um, for our boys, um, they actually made, they actually made it to the final four, and I don't know if you guys know what the final four is, but it's basically um, where I believe um, six teams are going to be playing against each other, and it is most likely that our boys are going to make it to uh, to become state champions because this year uh, their league is very good, and because um, they made it to the final four, which is the first time in history. Um, School for tomorrow on March 9th will run on a short schedule, and um, the school bought two fan buses for students who don't have rights to be able to go to the Denver Coliseum to go watch our boys uh, basketball play. And um, it's going to be a really awesome moment um, just seeing how all the teachers and admin and the students today and like this past week have been really excited for a game that um, is going to be so hyped up and just building that school spirit has made me excited to go. And um, I really wanted to bring this um, to the school board because, um, like I said, it's such a cool accomplishment for our boys basketball and our school to be able to have this opportunity to go to um, the final four for state. So, thank you. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs>
And then um, as well, our boys volleyball um, started playing. Um, as you guys know, um, this is the first year that boys volleyball has started at Eagle Ridge Academy. So we'll see how that season goes for this year for the boys. And as well as uh, the season for girls has started for girls soccer. So their first game will be March 9th, which is tomorrow. Um, for our, uh, drama, the play that goes wrong, um, they're still continuing rehearsals and dates and location are still determined, but um, we'll let you know when that when those dates come up. And then um, if you pass by Eagle Ridge um, anytime soon, you'll see that there's construction on the soccer field. Um, right now, um, it looks like the soccer field is going pretty well. It looks like the surface is very flat, so it's almost done so we can start having um, girls um, soccer play um, for the home games. And then um, as well, interact read to the children at Pennock Elementary Fort Red Across America Day on March 2nd. And um, I heard that that was a really cool experience for interact members and they were very thankful to be able to read to um, elementary students because it's a really cool opportunity as well. And then uh, for prom, uh, it's been finalized. That's going to be on April 8th at the Denver Aquarium. And the theme was, the theme that won was the lost city of Atlantis. We had the student body vote and um, they, were, they voted for the lost city of Atlantis. And then um, within that, we have Powerpuff um, events going up. So um, if you don't know what Powerpuff is, it is girls football. Um, I'm going to be joining that, so I'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> But um, the signups are going up, and then um, student council as well has been working on prom committees. And this week, um, sp specifically, um, student, the student council um, made a video to uh, release what the prom thing was. And they're also going to go um, visit the prom venue to see um, how it looks like and get an idea of what to do for decorations. That's it. Any questions? What time is the game tomorrow? I know if you don't. It's at 1245. At 1245, I'll see him. Yeah, so they have, uh, we, we had multiple schools that were involved in the regional and state playoffs, uh, and it's only the Ridge boys that remain. They're in the final four, so they're one game away from the championship game. Should they win tomorrow, they'll play for the champ to be state champions, which is pretty cool. Any questions for Diana? I want you to bring back the good news at the next meeting, all right? Okay, well. The first ever championship, we're going to bring it home. <laughs> Who did they play? Uh, they play Holy Family. Uh, for girls basketball, we play Holy Family as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think I've got it right. I think um, no, Eagle Ridge is the only um, public school. They're char chartered, but they're public school. They're the only charter school or public school left from the Final Four. The other three schools are all private Christian schools, Holy Family, Resurrection Christian, and another one I can't think of. That is true. And as well as this year was the first year that we moved to a 4A league, meaning uh, we're playing bigger schools as well. That's exciting. Yeah. Okay, so we have things going on, kind of. Um, so we had a in person, like volunteer day um, for the elementary kids, it was a STEAM day, so they had different um, activities on February 28th. Apparently, it was a lot of fun. Uh, they had a bunch of different activities for the little kids, like a beekeeper, clay brains, and so they got to play with all this cool stuff. Um, counseling aid students have, we've been finding scholarship programs and then creating like a spreadsheet of it to give to seniors or early graduates. That way they can find any scholarships that they want to go to. We right now are holding a host of hygiene drive to support Almost Home in Brighton. On the right side is a list of the stuff they want. So if anyone wants to bring anything, they said just drop it by the school, they'll take it. And then and it's finals week, so we have finals going on, and then we're all excited for spring break. But that's about it. Yeah, no, but so one take parade you on behalf of LB and Christopher because they're obviously not here. Ray, you want to do that? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so for Prairie View, NHS is preparing for their spring carnival. Uh, their CTE building is coming along greatly, and the framing is done. 
Um, they started in school tutoring this week, as well as have a school dance coming up in March. Um, what a bad cancel. <laughs> <laughs> um, spring sports are starting up. Soccer has their home opener this Friday. And then Literally Blonde, their uh, spring musical, is has their first song this Friday. Uh, and then they also have a blood drive happening on March 17th. Um, this is the seniors' last third quarter. They have no school Friday, um, and everyone is getting very excited about it. Prom is going to be at Top Golf, um, and their theme is Masquerade. Um, and then just inductions are tonight, which is why uh, I'm assuming LB and Christopher aren't here. And then they also have Wish Week starting up soon to also support um, Meg Wish. Any questions? I might make up answers to. <laughs> <laughs> I do not know why this, the dance was sadly canceled. I like I, the, Ray might die. Ray, make up something. Why was it canceled sadly? I, I, don't, I, I don't know. Andy claims to know. I just read it on Facebook. I don't know if it's true. I think there was some behavior issues. And admin made the message up to me. That is sad. That is sad. That's why it's sadly canceled. Okay, at Riverdale, winter sports have all come in, and with all of our sports ending the season off pretty great, especially with basketball making it to the some semifinals. I don't remember what numbers. Uh, spring sports have begun. This week with our boys volleyball coming right out of the gates with their first win on Monday, which is super cool since it's the first year of boys volleyball. Um, as you saw, theater of a Midsummer Night's Dream is underway. Showtimes will be tomorrow, Friday and Saturday from 7 to 9 and then Sunday from 2 to 4. We have course registration currently going on with all of the CTE classes being open now. Um, we have a choir concert on the 15th at 7. And then our student leader team sent bookmarks to Henderson Elementary <coughs> for Read Across America. And then prom is going to be on April 15th at the Gaylord with the theme of Mystery at the Manor because our crowns got stolen. <laughs> oh, oh. The crown fixed the mystery that they have stolen. But the king and queen will not be. <laughs> Predictions for you. Thank you. Tyler. Tyler Steve. Tyler Steve. Tyler. So um, there's not a lot on here because we have been very busy these last couple of weeks getting ready for our squish night, which is tomorrow at 7, sadly. Like, apparently we're not there planning these things because everyone else is doing things on our exhibition nights. It's fine. It's whatever. It's great. I'm so tired. <laughs> um, okay, so quarter three is coming to a long way to close. This project period has been particularly rough on the sophomores. Um, I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, and like I said, our extradition night is from tomorrow, is tomorrow from five to six, and then from seven to eight. So the five to six period will be for freshmen and they are presenting a farm to be designed. So they were working in groups to design a functioning farm. They were told just basically pick anywhere in the entire world that you're gonna have your farm and um, tell us how you're gonna do it. Like what are animals you're gonna have on it? And it was a lot of fun. I actually got to help um, Shark Tank some of the farm pitches for students today. So I got to criticize them. That was nice. <laughs> One of my favorites, though, is a group named theirs Alpacatraz, and they are an island in the Mediterranean Sea that has alpacas, hence the name Alpacatraz. It's, I know, I got the kick out of it, too. Um, yeah, and then our sophomores have all been writing research papers. Um, I think, I'm not, I'm not sure. We have so many cohorts, it's so hard for me to keep track right now. Um, cohort two, I know that I'm positive, they did a research paper on the rhythm and cycles, just like any rhythm and cycle. Um, I did mine on 
like um, a scheduling model in any given schooling environment, what a student's grade looks like, and then what students would prefer, so like creative conventional rigorous, which I actually had a lot of fun with. Um, yeah. So other than that, we have Accelerator Week is next week, which is kind of a big deal. Um, there are 33 off-campus trips, so that means that 33 times throughout next week, um, with the exception of three of those being overnight trips, um, most of the people will be off of campus. There's two, yes, two accelerated week options that will stay on campus, and those are screen printing and um, gaming week. Uh, the three overnight trips are a ghost towns and mining towns trip throughout Colorado. Um, they are going to Leadville and I don't know the other one. There, there's a couple there too. Um, and then we are doing this every year. So we have four accelerated weeks throughout the year. The first and then the third will be um, overnight backpacking trips with um, Anna Parker being one of the guides every single time and then a different one for each accelerated week. Um, this one, however, is their trip to Utah, Moab. So they're going for four nights, five-ish days, um, starting off, uh, no, yeah, okay, I was wrong. Four days, three nights, um, starting on Tuesday next week, and they will be gone up until Friday. So, yeah, they have a lot of fun in Moab. I don't get to go because I'm upset, no. So is that. Uh, and then I believe the third overnight trip is um, one that's going to Glendale and they're doing a Southern Colorado inspiration trip, which Glendale's not in Southern Colorado. I, I don't know why I said Glendale. That was the other one. That's what it was. See? Um, oh, this was a really big thing too. So Chelsea Thompson, our FFA president, I think that's what you call her. I don't remember. Um, she won the Charter Champion Award recently, so she got to go to the big conference that they had, and she was presented this award, and it's kind of a big deal that no one knows about. So, yeah, there's that. Um, okay. All right. Any questions? <laughs> you need to call your mother so you can go overnight. No, I got um, aviation and aerospace, so we're going to be going up to um, Broomfield, the Denver Metropolitan Airport, and uh, looking at some aircraft there, and we're going to go to the Space Force Base, and um, we'll get some helicopters, we'll get to ride one, you know, lots, lots of fun things. Actually, my dad's, my dad's coming on Wednesday, too. He's going to meet us at Metro. And show us planes. Metro. Metro definitely has its um, pilots program and stuff like that. It's grown here, so hey, it's a good one. It really has, yeah. My younger brother was there last night for Civil Air Patrol, actually, so that's fun. Hey, Zoe, uh, the screen that I said, but is it, when are you doing the collections, the donations? So we are currently doing them, and I think it's up until this Friday, so if you just go to, like, Walmart, Dollar Tree, get something, they will, you just gotta go to the door and they'll say, hey, I'm here to drop off donations, and they'll let you in the building. They don't care who you are. They'll just let you in. <laughs> if you got to give, you know, budgets wise. <laughs> Wait, I, I did forget something. Um, so I know that I like to promote that as this like B type school where we're just like <laughs> the ten good ten school. Hey, um, President Prashki, my mother calls it hippie school. That's where I got that from. <laughs> Um, actually, no, there's like, there, there's a point to this. Um, we have instituted a new detention policy. So I, I actually feel like that's kind of important to share. Did you get detention? I have not. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> Are we exploring the process? Totally. <laughs> okay, so, um, one main criteria that we're instituting because we saw a very, like, massive amount of students being tardy to class. Um, we do the 15 minutes at the beginning of the day, it's called Hive, it's really an advisory class to, like, check in throughout the day and set goals for the week on Mondays. Um, a lot of people weren't going to that thing, so they were, they were being tardy or they were late. Um, you can get a late pass for our office people, but they weren't doing that. So our dean, um, Mario Padilla, and our principal, Amy, well, Lee, I, I think that they were like the, I think Mario was actually the mastermind behind the whole thing. Um, 
three times throughout the week and you get um practical detention. So I don't know. Clean the animals thoughts. Oh, we don't actually have that, but yeah, but that did need to be on another tangent. So um <laughs> This I don't actually relate it to. So, said, I don't know if you knew this, a lot of people don't actually. Um, we have a microcarney. So, the entire point behind the microcarney is to give students a space to explore their entrepreneurial side um, in the sense that we give them the opportunity to have a storefront and we give them the space to make their products like food, whatever that is. Um, we had a meeting today at Three Green Coffee House, which is just up the street from us. And we were discussing board positions um, and how we're going to incorporate uh, like a shark type model, um, the finances, um, operations, uh, and then the marketplace. So we actually come up with a really cool model. Um, we're going to design a coffee house that will then be put on said land, hopefully, hopefully, um, and it will be used as a, I hit the microphone, it will be used as a community outreach center. So it will be like a coffee shop that people can come in and like go and get actual coffee, not like paper. Um, but it will also be a space for students to conduct like, um, meetings and conferences and then on probably one of the days throughout the week, because that's when you have to do things. Um, we will have like a farmer's market. So students who have a business will get to come and um, sell their things to community people. I just, I, I wanted to share that. I wish I would try to sell you stuff. You know, this certainly isn't a hippie school. You embrace capitalism, so <laughs> carry there, on. There's that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I'm going to do final questions for our students? Yes, we have one final question for you all. So we've said April 12th as a dinner date with the board. We talked about doing that. So we're day April 12th. You're all looking in your mind and your calendar in your head, ready to see if you're free that night. But we said uh, Wednesday, April 12th, for dinner with you and your and two guests. Okay, so um, I'm thinking your, your parents or guardians, okay? And then the question is, what would you like for dinner and not Chick fil A or Taco Bell or McDonald's? Or Italian and. Nothing Italian. Uh, so we'll do six actually, six o'clock. All I ask is I don't like seafood. I'm sorry. Not like me either. <laughs> but anything but seafood. That's all I ask. I have to have chicken nuggets. Because I might bring my little brother to the house. If you could do your little brother, I'll bring chicken. All right, that sounds like a good thing. That's a good one. 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 That's a good I don't know if it's a weapon. I don't know. I mean, it's a new seafood, chicken nuggets, and brings your brother. Well, um, not something you can live with. If we could get Texas Roadhouse, I don't know yeah, how that would be. Yeah, if that works, if not, then we could figure out something else. Diana, say that again about Texas Roadhouse. If we can do the Texas Roadhouse for dinner, if that's an option. I think it is an option. We'll cater it in. Bread rolls must be included. <laughs> yeah, it's bread and butter. Yeah. Oh, uh, and butter. <laughs> okay. 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 We can have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next scenario. Diana. Diana. Thank you.
Next up is our superintendent's report. So, Dr. Finkel. Uh, it's very hard to follow. Um, you know, but, but I'll be brief tonight. First of all, I want to thank uh, the River Deer River Ridge Theater Company, and Mr. Farner. They left the room, but I am grateful for them. They did a fabulous job. Uh, and as you well know, they're not the only show in town, right? So uh, we're in the middle of the spring shows, and uh, we encourage you to catch one or more if you're able. Um, just want to put uh, you, you all know Sam, and we I got announced this two weeks ago. Uh, we have our very first ever director of safety and security, and it's our very own Sam Ortega. Uh, excited for Sam, and also excited that he will now have the opportunity to build a safety program with the Mill Debbie Override money. Uh, put that plan into place as we head into next school year. So excited for Sam. Uh, we did do a search, uh, we had finalists. That uh, was Sam and a woman from DPS, two finalists. Yeah, just the two. Terry's not here tonight. He's, he's off tonight, but just those two finalists. Yeah, we had a ton of applicants. Yeah, the two finalists were Sam and a woman from DPS. Uh, this is bittersweet news if you're a Thunderhawk. Um, so Mike Burke, uh, the Hugh Hall probably saw that announcement, uh, is our new director of post-secondary workforce readiness. Uh, again, did a, did a search there. We had three finalists uh, for that position. Uh, two were internal, and another one from a charter school in the Denver area. I'm looking at Willis, give me the nod, yes. Uh, but uh, Mike was selected. We're thrilled for Mike. Set for the Bridgeview community. Um, that pretty new principal position posted already Monday. Uh, so we're busy chasing that. Uh, I think Jamie will lead that. Uh, I'm trying to find Michael's replacement because we, it's just like for teachers, it's competitive with administrators as well. So we're chasing that quickly. The bittersweet news there, but excited for Mike is he takes Paul Francisco's place when Paul retires in July. And there's lots to do there to maximize that middle of your money around uh, CTE. Um, I think you're all aware that this is not a job announcement, but, but Sal Conkett at Anderson Elementary has shared with us that he plans to um, end his time with us at the end of the school year. Um, again, bittersweet, uh, Sal's decision, um, and uh, you know that's a great story. He was a, he was a student at Anderson Elementary, he's a bright high school grad, uh, but we're, we're sad to see him go, and I think that is posted as well. But yep, that one's up already as well. Because again, we want to be we want to be quick to fill and, and be out searching for folks. But one of us was uh, thanks Sal for his service. Wish him the very best. Fall that's next. He's not going to go away. He'll still be around, I'm sure. Um, speaking of recruitment, um, the 27th J virtual meeting pre. We have two events Friday and uh, Saturday mornings. Um, if you would like to participate in that, we can get you the link to that event. It's virtual. I'm happy to share that with board members. Okay with you, Michael? Yeah, we've done that in the past. Just have them be a part of that and say hello. And um, but we've got two events scheduled there. I know Michael did a job fair, a case job fair, either last this week or last week, and we were pleasantly surprised. There are about 400 teachers there, um, but everyone's searching for teachers. We do have this virtual event, and you see we're playing on the bachelor there. Uh, Trying to grow to be able to come work for us uh, where you work. Uh, but my kudos to uh, Michael and his team in HR, as well as Janelle's team in communications to uh, try to sway people to come work for us instead of others. Should be a woman next year. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun. Um, we have tonight for your approval and some of them in the audience, and you're going to bring them up in just a minute. But we you can see again where candidates are tonight for your approval. Uh, extremely, feel extremely fortunate and blessed to have had as many quality folks interested in serving in the middle of the oversight uh, committee as we had. As you know, we're down to nine for your selection tonight or approval tonight. You made your selections, but I know some of them in the audience. You can bring them up here in just a minute. I uh, just some just some celebrations here recently. Um, Preview High School hosted again the Leadership Counter City Group. So that's a um, that is a group put on by the Adams Fourteen Foundation. Um, so we had, I don't know, a dozen or 15 folks uh, that were at Prairie View High School during this Leadership Commerce City experience. They go around and visit different uh, locations each month, uh, and, their, and their education was their topic uh, this past Friday. So they were at Prairie View High School in the morning, and they were over at Adams City High School in the afternoon. But I just want to give tremendous kudos uh, to Prairie View High School, Schools of Business students, and then Gene Snyder and the most you've met Gene, but they were fantastic as always. And then um, 
uh, they, so the folks that were involved there uh, toured our current CT programming in the building and then they went outside and took a tour of the CT center. And I was uh, fortunate to go out and join them for that tour. Again, I'm blown away by the size of those facilities. Uh, but that was exciting. And then just as I think about our neighbor, uh, and I was 14, uh, Terry and Sarah and I, uh, and you may remember, he's a member of that reorg committee. So he and I attended the Adams 14 State of District Luncheon yesterday that Carla Lorraine and her, and her team hosted. Um, really an uplifting event in terms of, you know, their, their frame was, it's time for them to start telling their story. It's time for the other people tell it for them. Uh, but Carla and her team did a really nice job uh, with the luncheon yesterday, kicking off the things that they're chasing. Uh, they are transitioning to policy governance model. So their board is working towards that end. Uh, so it was fun to see them at the beginning of that journey. Uh, but again, just very uplifting and multiple students that were there. They had a middle school orchestra there. Uh, they had their junior RTC program to present the colors. They had, uh, she must have been about a third grader. I introduced uh, Dr. Lorea in English and Spanish. And she talked to the group about, I'm practicing my English and my Spanish here today instead of at school, it's just a sweetheart. And then they had, uh, it, it just gave me flashbacks to my own elementary experience. They had a recorder group play hot cross buns. <laughs> <laughs> and the only song you can play hot cross buns, I don't know if that was what they played. Um, but just, just a lot of fun to see uh, all the good work that they're doing. I know they're doing it now. It's 14, but again, their frame was really it's time for them to start telling their story. So it was, it was fun to be a part of that. Uh, but just a reminder of the events coming up. You're the students tonight talking about spring break. I'm sure there are adults that feel the same way. They're excited for that. To um, the only thing that I added there, um, Monday, April 17th, is the 27J Education Foundation luncheon that's scheduled to be at the Adams County Conference Center. Um, so I will gladly purchase uh, a table for you all to attend if you'd like to do that. And then we'll, Jamie and others, make a note. I'm going to send it out to principals and invite them to join us. Because that's a Monday. And we chose the Monday so that we could have more participation from our buildings. But I'll get that out. Thanks to Janelle and Lori and others that sent on that. Um, other duties is assigned to my 27 Ed Foundation. But that's an additional date there that wouldn't have been um, 42 weeks ago. I think that is it. Questions or comments tonight for me? Um, I know I've reached out to um, Adams 14 before. Um, as they're switching to policy governance, because we've been on it for a while, if they have any questions or if they'd like to maybe connect to understand more about it, but we'd be open to it if they're in that place. So. I think I can remind them of that. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, moving we on. Um, the appointment of membership of the 2022 Mill Levy Override Oversight Committee. The Board of Education will be making appointments to the 2022 Mill Levy Override Oversight Committee. And I'd like to um, read them by name. And if you're here, please come up to the front so that the people can get to know your faces. So if they have questions. If, if I could, yeah. this, is the, this is the surprise final round. So they're going to call you up and you're going to have to answer questions from the audience. <laughs> you're going by surprise. Um, so for the North Pointing area, we have Stephanie Walcott Burkett and Michaela Zambrano. If you're here, come on out. Um, South Pointing area, Gabby Chavez and Rachel Wilhelm. The West Pointing area, Christy Donovan and Allison Marlin. And our at large representatives are Rhiannon Collins, Michael Kuba, and Roberta Tenney. Thanks. This, this process has been, um, has been, it's been a good process. Uh, we had about 70 people that uh, showed interest and um, then we had interviews and about 30 people showed up and then we had to whittle and down some more. Um, for all of us on the board that were there, um, it was there were some tough decisions. So thank you very much for um, helping us out with this and um, going forward and just uh, being an outreach and a voice for our district to our constituents. So thank you very much for that.
and Greg, I would just add, we're thrilled that seven of nine of you are here. Yes. Uh, Roberta is traveling, I think, tonight, and then Kitty sent an email to all of us. She has a son who's, uh, that she's watching at a concert to be on tonight. So he recently started playing the flute, I think, our event, and she wanted to go support her son. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, thanks for being here. Thank you very much. My arm is still sore from the fights over who we were going to pay. Thank you. You can go ahead and sit down. Thank you. Do I have a motion? I move that the Board of Education approve the members you just read to our 2022 <laughs> Bill that we override oversight committee. Right here, a second. I'll second that. Hearing it so moved by Director Green and seconded by Director Word. Can I get a roll call, please? Are you guys identifying the board members as well? Oh, well, yes. They did. They did. Yes, I am so sorry. The two board members, um, as of right now, uh, will be um, Director Thornton and myself. And when the board, um, when the elections happen in November, the board will be um, choosing the committees again. So we will, uh, I'll be off, but um, the rest of the board will uh, go ahead and uh, assign two other people to take that. So move as amended. Okay. Could I get a roll call? Yeah. Right. Dr. Khan. Aye. Dr. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Dr. Petrosky. Aye. Dr. Thomas. Aye. Dr. Thornton. Aye. Dr. Beville. Aye. Dr. Wirt. Aye. Thank you and congratulations. Yes, thank you. Great. Can I? I just wanted to comment. It, in conversations I've had with some of our, with some of our community members, they said the reason I voted this time is because of the oversight committee. And I was like, God, if you told us that, we would have done this years ago. <laughs> That's all it would have taken to get you to vote yes. So I just thank you guys so much for for what you're going to do for our community. It's going to go a long ways in helping us pass future mills. And so um, I just appreciate you guys stepping up because this is going to be huge. Have fun spending that money. <laughs> and, and one thing that will be asked of you a lot, and um, you'll uh, maybe have to correct some of our community, um, mills versus bonds. So bonds are for bricks and mills are for bills. So if you keep that in mind, that might help them um, understand that a little bit as it goes on, because sometimes they get intertwined. But uh, thank you very much for that, uh, definitely. And just wanted to double check. You did get uh, myself and Director Gordon for the Okay. All right. Okay, <laughs> and item number nine. I'm, I'm, sorry. Just, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. No, just I'm clarity not. for our new members. Um, I think that the uh, of the draft that Janelle sent out to you folks talked about a June meeting for a kickoff. It'll be a July meeting, and I would ask that you mark July 11th. Is that just as a tentative date? Um, we're still looking at meeting about every other month. I think it'll be six meetings or so a year. But we're looking at that July kickoff. Um, staff is heading into April and then 100 days of May. So we know it's going to be really chaotic. Um, because of my transition, I, I'll be out the month of June. Just wanted to let her know. But, so we're going to look at that July 11th date that we'll kick off that first meeting. Just mark that down tentatively. I'll get an email out to have you to mark that down. Okay. So, still, well, not until June, and I have to experience 100 days of May. Uh, but just to, again, looking at that second Tuesday of the month, okay, um, and July 11th will be the first one we'll kick off. And then while I have the mic, Kobe, it's so good to see you. Man. Past uh, Student Advisory Council member, Kobe Clemens. Yeah, good to see you. That was like a love connection. Uh, I didn't want to say that, but uh, you did. <laughs> you would be right, Mr. Green. You can read the room well. Yeah. All right. Um, if you'd like to stay, you can. Thank you for being here. But if you, um, for the um, oversight committees, if you'd like to go home to your family too, that's more than welcome. So thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. And thank you for everything that you do for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Item number nine, matters of public comment. There are no matters of public comment, so I don't have to read any of this tonight. You're welcome, Tom. <laughs> we'll move on to consent agenda. All matters listed under consent agenda are operational matters about which the board has governing policies, implementation of which is delegated to the superintendent. 
They will be enacted in one motion by category and order listed below. There will be no discussion of these items prior to the time the board of directors vote on a motion, unless members of the board, staff, or public request specific items to be discussed separately and or removed from the section. Any member of the public who wishes to discuss a consent agenda item should notify the president of the board at the time requested and to be recognized by invitation of the president to address the board. Um, a, approval of Board of Education minutes for the 2022 Mill of the Override Oversight Committee interviews that occurred on January 30th, 2023, February 6th, 2023, and February 13th, 2023. The alternate date of February 23rd, 2023 was not needed to complete the interviews. Approval of the minutes for the February 22nd, 2023 study session and regular meetings. Item B, approval of personal items on memorandum dated March 1st, 2023. Do I have a motion? Move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Hearing it so moved by Director Kahn and seconded by Director Worth. Can I get a roll call, please? Director Kahn. Aye. Yes. Thank you. Director Petrosky. All right. Director Thomas. Aye. Director Thornton. Aye. Director Vito. Aye. Director Worth. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Item 11 governance process that supports our global goals. Ownership linkage. Nothing to report. Okay. Oh, I'm glad we at least figured out on the middle for, for our next linkage. So, yeah. Um, Board of Education, Director Khan, Director Thomas. I have nothing to report. Um, uh, Board of Committees, EPAC. Um, we met last week. Um, it was interesting talking about um, how things are coming about um, uh, with registrations. Um, some of our schools and what we're expecting are a little bit lower, but that's because a lot of the kindergarten registrations haven't come in yet. So um, uh, we never know where those kindergartners are gonna come and what school they're gonna be at. So um, they're a little light, but other than that, it looks like we are going to be at or a little bit past or where we were this year. So unlike other school districts, we are not going to be losing students at least projected wise right now. Um, talked about um, the discovery, uh, Discovery Magnet School and how that's going. And um, I believe um, there's gonna be three of, uh, three sections of kindergartners first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and then two for seventh and eighth. Um, so uh, it'll be uh, filling out and going from there. Uh, there was talk about bus routes of going there and transporting to there. And then others were just um, the construction that's going on, how it's going to uh, take effect of everything else. Um, home sales are um, kind of slow uh, with the um, raise of interest rates. That's kind of uh, cool the market a little bit. But um, some of the others is uh, there's homes that were up for sale, and then as the interest rates grew, some people had to back out of that home that was uh, that home that was being built because. And they couldn't afford it, but there's a lot of stuff. Um, there's a lot of future tracks that are still open, ready to go, and developing is starting to go back into it. Um, so it's going there, but um, it's cooling off a little bit. And that could just be the interest rates, but we'll see how things go with that. So that's about everything on the end back of any member. Um, Capital uh, Facility Fee Foundation. Nothing to report. Um, Rocky Mountain Risk, um, because of the Wednesday date, we have not uh, um, met uh, with the change, but I believe April 12th, correct? No, 19th. April 19th is the date uh, that we're going to meet um, and try to move forward on the uh, same Wednesday as we go there. Uh, 27 Jane Believers. We are looking at dates to see if we can squeeze it in before the end of the year without piling too much in May. So, Lynn can we just... I was going to look at the calendar with you after the meeting. All right. Um, Trevor City and School District 27J use tax. Nothing to report. Okay. Um, 2021 Bond Oversight Committee. Yes, we had talked uh, last time about how we had an exercise where we got bond bucks, and there were 11 members of the committee that use their dollars to vote for certain projects. We have $5.6 million left over 
from the 2015 bond. And I just wanted to share with you what these bond books look like. They're, they're kind of monopoly money, but somebody did a really good job of making these bond books. So I wanted to let you sh share the joy of what these bond books look like. And then on the spreadsheet, so you can see here that the, the main projects that we voted on were lock upgrades. Uh, that was, those projects were 78% funded. Dedicated Emergency Operations Center, we've never had that. We, we would like to have that. That was 60% funded. Enhanced weatherization was 58% funded. Uh, school upgrades to district standards and what exactly those district standards are we don't we haven't really clarified what that is but we know that there are some schools that are not quite up to our standards uh, that was 52 percent funded and inflation protection was 22 percent funded and then you can see the the other items that we voted on but it was a, it was a really good exercise and you can probably count on the fact that the remaining 2015 bond money will go to those first five or six projects. And that's it. And that's, unless there's questions. Leon, yes. Uh, and maybe this is for Dr. Feedback. Couldn't the dedicated emergency operations center come from the uh, bill levy override funds? I would say no, that's a capital, that's a capital project. So the I know you I know we get to go to the bill. I, I thought we worded it for for security is idea. Yeah, the mill levy will definitely pay for the people that are running it. Yeah. I don't know if I I don't know if we can yeah, kind of make the thoughts go further. I get it, I get it, yeah. My initial answer is I don't think so. And I'm, I'm confused about the donation possible actual average. What, what is the donation? So that was just the word that was used. So there were 11 people uh, and the column B where the project amount is, that's how much the project will cost to do. So it was possible that if the, the rule was that each person could put in up to the amount of the project in the little box. So if you multiply column B by 11, you'll get column C, which is the, the possible amount. The actual amount donated in each box is in column D. And then, of course, you divide that by 11, and you get the average donation in column E. And then that's how we arrived at the funding percent. So are they going to do the funding at those percentages, or are they going to take like the top five? It's just, we're, we're going to talk about it. Yeah, it's process. an activity and prioritization, right? right? So again, um, it's showing, so it's, it's only on we're not saying about the money, right? So you know, like people here over, you end up with more money in the project potentially. But you see, there was ten million dollars of those of the eleven people that put their money into that. The average donation is really what matters to me. You see, it's all the average is almost fully funding that first one, right? So it just creates a prioritization. Um, and again, the percentage of the funding, I can think about that. That is yes, yep, I believe it is. Yep. But again, this rich priority list. It was an activity. Um, it was done secretly, if you will, because people went out and put their money in the box, and people were watching. But now that they have this data, you know, give us something to talk through in our next meeting. Does this meet our does this meet our needs or wants based on the priorities that were expressed by the group? It was a good, really good activity. It was a great activity. Yeah. Because it made it real, right, in terms of spending your mind. And for the people that are watching, that are out there, this is the leftover mm -hmm. contingency money uh, premium and interest left on the 2015 bond, not the 2021 bond. So, sure. Um, Brighton Youth Commission. Yeah, so um, Brighton Youth Commission right now is still working very vigorously towards their Speak Week um, event uh, coming up in April. Uh, I would like to note that we do have a Brighton Youth Commissioner in the audience tonight. Ellie, want to say hi? 
and her mother joined her as well. Um, she never did give me a reason why she's here, but I'm glad to have you here. So thank you so much. I don't have to tell you what I'm here. Wow. Welcome to my world. Wow, boy, that's <laughs> well, as uh, definitely on that with the Youth Commission, I think uh, Speed Week is definitely something that is still in the forefront of um, a lot of teenagers and um, mental health out there and all of that going on. I was just talking to a student that I was with today that you know, oh, I matter has been going for about a year. They haven't even heard of it. So all of that, just keep the word out as soon as you get to the point where you're tired of talking about it people are finally starting to hear it so keep up the good work we definitely need it one other thing there is we did have two commissioners that attended the uh, uh superintendent finalists uh thing and they grilled our superintendent finalists pretty well i think right Is that fair yeah. and they were they were really impressed they both said it wasn't what they expected it was going to be but it was way better so that was really cool they enjoyed it Matters. I just want to say thank you for the new flag up in front of the board. Thanks goes to former board director Ricky Sack and his team here at the uh, Blark. But thanks for calling that to our attention. But he was kind enough to care that for us. Um, the uh, Casby um, bylaw committee's review what they met on Saturday. I was not able to attend um, because of a previous commitment, but. Um, they are now sitting out sheets, so if there's any section of the bylaws that you'd like to look at and have them review, you can fill that out. I'll get that out this week. You can fill it out and um, put it in, and then we'll kind of prioritize what needs to be looked at. If there's sections that don't, then we put our and devote our time more on the sections that do. So that's going to be out there. Uh, we're trying to do a quick turnaround, so we have a uh, long, long time to really break up those sections and get into the uh, business of that. Um, our report will be done in the fall retreat, and then it will be voted on in uh, December at uh, CASB. So, any others? Okay. All right. Expectations of the board. Uh, board acts to accept, reject the following reports due submitted since last meeting. There are none at this time. B, Deputy Superintendent Will Pierce also a uh, superintendent finalist, will present the expectation of the board report for Global Goal 1.4 School Social Emotional Learning Dashboard. Back of the title bit. <laughs> and you have Jamie White helping out with this. Of course, thank you for being here. Good evening. Uh, Thank you for letting us uh, come talk. I'll have uh, Jane help you with this presentation. She's here. She's staying for a long time. So that's also good to hear Paul, who's not through. Um, this, is, this is your monitor report about their humans. And, and I'll, I'll start off. Uh, this is the criteria that we selected together back in March of 2021. I, I have this whole page here on page one. If you haven't had a chance to uh, review it, I'd like to again give the off of the disclaimer for this data um, one of the proudest things that we have we we've talked to our colleagues across the metro area and no one's trying to define this right and so that's fair right it, it'd be really hard to define what a good human is um, but we have some indicators and some markers uh, about what it may be and and i really believe and i'm proud that that sometimes we take on goals uh, just to chase them Right, just just to dive into them, just to try to figure out more, just to do more work to try to articulate what it is. Every time that we do an iteration of this report, or we learn so much from the report, and our our our, our practitioners in the field give us feedback on these reports, and why are we collecting that? We should be looking at this, and that whole idea and study of it is something that I think is really important to us all. So I I I appreciate the goal. But the data we have in here probably is not representative. We cannot draw a straight line conclusion that these are good humans that are represented in this data, nor can we draw conclusions that the kids who misbehave, they're not attended regularly enough or not um, pass the, the, the whole child needs assessment or, or bad humans, right? So um, it just allows us to continue to refine and, and be on the lookout for kids at need, in need, 
and, and sharpen our skills about what is it that we, we want to promote and inspire out of our kids to be better. So the call is worth it. I'm grateful for this board. We, we should always chase goals that are a little hard to define. And just, just earlier, we were talking to colleagues across the metro area going, you have a definition for this? Like, no, we never try to take that on. It's like, yeah, we are. And our board's okay with it. So let's take this goal on. Um, at the same time, the data that you're going to see is real. Um, you will see some trends in here that, 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 are, that cause us to be excited and some trends that also cause us to be a little anxious and nervous. Um, they're broken into three parts. Our good, good human goal, the first one is about um, each man, 27 man of school, will have increased the percentage of students who are demonstrating proficient uh, social emotional skills uh, by 2% every year uh, until, until all kids, every kid is proficient in this area. There's the criteria. Um, it's, a, it's a social emotional common assessment. We, we can link that for you, get that for you, but it's basically straight from the five castle competencies, um, social awareness, self-management, um, self-awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Um, and, and that's one criteria. Uh, kids attending well is another criteria. And, and that's a high bar. Uh, the percent of individual kids who are attending school 90% of the time or more. Think about you and your work. Did you attend work 90% of the time or more? Um, on average, we run about a 93% attendance rate at school. But when you add every kid, how much are you here? That's what's represented in support. And then behavior, just based on the percent of students who have not been suspended or, or expelled in any way. So I will turn it over to Jamie as she can talk through the actual data that you'll see on this next slide. Hello. Um, so we have two different columns. The left-hand side is quarter two from last year. And then the, compare, the left was baseline. And then comparing to quarter two of 2023, um, using quarter two as the last data available from the ESCO on assessment. Um, so that first line there is 27 J schools as a whole. So you can see that um, the percentage of students proficient or advanced in that common assessment went from 70.9% of kids to 71.8%. Same thing with attendance um, and behavior. Percent of kids who have not been suspended or expelled. And percent of kids who are attending 90% or more of the time. Keeping in mind that that is based on chronic attendance. So that is anything missed in a day, whether that is excused or unexcused, or a partial day, or one period, or all of those implications that help kids to just parts of it. And that's why that really is. Sorry, does that include a um, uh, student that is on an activity or uh, a sports? Um, some of those are exempt, okay. um, and some are not. It just depends on what it is. Uh, that you can see then broken down by each school. Um, the green, the ones that are highlighted green, indicate the ones who showed that growth in that column uh, by 2% mm -hmm. on that scope of assessment. And then we have one um, school that did not administer um, during quarter two, and that is South on the new elementary school, trying to get them up and going rather than focusing on this year's assessment. So I have a hard time defining exactly what a good human is too, right? Um, because I believe all children are, are and, um, you know, maybe experiencing difficult things in their lives. Because um, as we know, hurt people hurt people, right? That's why we see bullying and stuff. So is, is the point to start intervention when we see trends in certain student populations in order to bring that number up? And is that... In a, is that the point of this? Yes. So the, the whole, and we'll talk about this in the next one a little bit more. The point is for kids to identify when they're having a hard time, us to look at the skills they're showing us, and then to find out if they're using those skills. So right? in theory, if you have all the SEL, SEL skills that you need, we would expect that you would be able to attend and behave with those skills. Now we have kids who have all the skills and don't do that, and we have kids who have lack in those skills and do have some resiliency, right? And so and everything in between. The ultimate goal is for us to be able to hand every school a list of kids that says these are the kids we need to early intervene with. So I'll I'll, I'll entertain questions. Um, we we report on compliance on this first day. Um, we just in looking at this monitor report and, and learning 
we would like to get this down to a score, right? So we could actually, so we have, we went up in uh, the number of the percent of kids that were demonstrating, or were, were aware of what the South skills were. We went down in attendance, we went down in, in the number of kids being suspended or, or expelled. We'd like to be able to aggregate that and do it in the, into a core score. Without being able to do that, you see one went up, two went down, doesn't feel like 2% is not compliant. When you get to the second goal, I think that this gets exactly to your question, um, Ashley. Um, each each, each 2017 managed school will see a decrease in the percentage of students demonstrating at risk behavior. So we have a different first attribute on there, different one is, is those that, that fill out the needs assessment, say, I have, I have, I'm concerned. We have stories, and I'll let Jamie tell them just from the beginning of the year, giving that. that that needs assessment out where you didn't know how many kids would be in need that they you give them a safe space to go and say I need help. And, and the numbers of kids that filled out that saying I'm I'm in need were, were pretty staggered. That would be one quality that I, I'm in need. I need help, right? So it's not not no longer based on the subtle competencies. It's like I know this stuff. It's like, no, I'm saying I'm in help, I'm I'm at risk, I'm at risk of not being okay. The second one is non-attenders. I'm avoiding and not being in school, kind of chronically not being in school. The third one would be tied to behavior kids that are getting consistently suspected or expelled. And, and that's where you'll see see this data here and how that's done. Jamie, want to talk about that? Sure. Um, so on the needs assessment, is set up the exact same way as the previous table. So the first column comparing last year to this year, uh, percentage of students asking for help in that specific category question. And this is a specific group of questions. So important to understand that whole child needs assessment has some questions that are screener questions where we're trying to determine if kids need some additional support, which leads to um, things that have been discussed tonight. How do we get kids counseling support that they need? How do we get them the resources they need? Are they asking for that? How do we help talk to the wrong groups to support different kids that are saying, I need help with this? There's some questions around that. For this, for the purpose of this report and the dashboard group, this is a very specific group of questions. So in elementary school, um, that group of questions is four questions around, I need help because people are mean to me because I look different than them, or my family comes from different places, I want help because I don't feel welcome or safe at school, I have grown-ups outside of school who can help me, and I like coming to school. Very simple, like just like basic core questions. Similar third through fifth grade, um, except for the addition of um, vaping, drugs, and alcohol, because yes, we are seeing it in third through fifth grade, and we are the kids who need support at that age. Um, and then at high school, um, similar questions, the wording is different um, to help them understand the questions at each level, but essentially the same thing, being teased or bullied or treated differently because of race, gender identity, LGBTQ plus status, disability, ethnic background, when you all the things that older kids can understand, it sounds a little different for them. Um, or they need help with vaping and drugs, which right now it appears as though maybe they all do. And then at least one adult inside school that believes in me and one outside and then go visit the safe house. So the question is just kind of, they're similar, they just age up. So in this report, um, these this represents kids who, who told us through the assessment that they are requesting help in that area. Then that allows counselors um, and um, support staff to reach out to the kids and ask some of those questions. Now, some of the other questions that we'll allude to that in that, um, are around um, wanting to hurt yourself and self-harm questions. And we get a lot of questions around, is that appropriate to ask an elementary school kid? Um, so one of the stories that will ask me to share was that we had an elementary school where we had 58 kids on the needs assessment, um, K through fifth grade, report that they were having feelings of hurting themselves. Um, 58 kids in one elementary school is a lot of kids that I think don't really know that data. Through the process that the counselors used, they were able to talk to some kids. A group of kids didn't understand the question. Good, go back to class. A group of kids had some, you know, things that maybe happened to them, and so they thought it was a big deal, helped them through that. And then a group of seven or eight kids who had plans to hurt themselves um, that we were able to intervene with. So just that's just an example of one school where that's some of the information that's coming from that, which allows us to provide additional counselors, additional support. Additional programming, additional, additional, additional. So, when you um, intervene with those students who actually have these thoughts of hurting themselves, at what point do we talk to the parents and what age level is it appropriate? Every point. 
talk to them. Okay, I'm alert. I have a to yes. Every, yes. Okay. Well, in, and I think actually what, what I appreciate about your question is this, this this is higher level data. This is a board goal. And we're still trying to work on giving you the data that tells you how many. And, but the use of the data and in the weeds of the data is far more valid. I mean, for a school staff to know how many kids at the school have somebody in the school feel they care and connect to, and how many kids don't feel they are connected to the school, that's powerful for a staff to do. And we know the names of those kids who don't feel connected and don't feel included. Like we, we can get all the way down to the individual student. That, that's really powerful for us to think about serving out people. Right? So just even one of the questions, not, not just to lump them for your report, but any one of the questions, I'm thinking I have drug problem. Same thing. How many kids do? Not nah, many, many of the kids did. Some of the kids did. It's the information we want to know about our kids. And then, always with partnership with our families to get them to know get aboard this talk to them if it's safe to do so right sometimes it's not that's not the first thing place to go to right? I just um, have a, oh go ahead <laughs> so these seven kids that had plans to hurt themselves how how well developed detailed were those plans developed enough that we would want to intervene I don't have the specific details, but they were concerned requiring assessment. Talk more about assessment. College assessment. A suicide assessment. Um, so this this table is trying to compare if we're struggling and we know we need help, it's probably impacting our ability to attend school, right? At least all day or sort of time stay or whatever. And then it's likely impacting the way we behave. Right, use the correlation. Again, the data that you can see, oh God, up and down, up and down. And so we're working on how we make that, those four correlates of one number tells us yes or no. And I think all of us, you know, fundamentally ask, because I have the same thing, would it be good in this job, or I believe in all kids. So this this idea, this good human of if I am or not, based on these factors, not convinced that that, that is, you know, there's some work still, but we're working through some of that, a lot of factors to consider when they're not acting. Would it be better if we rephrased it as whole human or something of that nature? <laughs> when we get a study session where we rename it, we would also love to engage you guys in uh, some of the decisions we have to make around. We've already got into it. When we do get this down to a whole number, we can tell you the exact number of kids, then decreasing it by 2% would be a really low goal. It's like, or increase, it's like, wait a second. They're actually talking about making this thing go by like 10 kids. Like, it, it probably meant two percentile points, right? So we, especially on this one, decreasing it by two percent, you can see the expulsion and suspension. We have kids that are getting in trouble, but it's it's most of our kids don't, right? A lot of our kids aren't. Right? And so we all hear you all hear as parents at school. There's a lot of things going wrong. You can see in some of the data here that it's not as many of the kids. It's, it's a few kids. But you put a few kids in a few categories across the thing that they're reaching out for help, they're getting in trouble. We should really intervene with that student. So that's one of this is that's what this what this monitor report liberates. It's not not just a report to you, it's a it's representative of a system and a practice all the way down into our schools that we're really trying to do. Including actually your comment last time, even even beginning to think about how we flow resources different to these schools. We had I we hadn't had that thought really until we started talking and you mentioned that. I said, yeah, this, those, those are how we're growing in this goal. So I'm, I'm excited about the iterative process, feedback, good, keep us, keep us going. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's important to clarify too. The goal, the actual stated goal is not good human goal. The good human is in quotes, right? Like that's not the name of the goal. The name came about because when we were talking about this, I said okay. we had like two or three, probably like at least part of two or three of our goals were around SAT scores. Yeah. And I thought it was silly that we had goals around SAT scores that was such a small subset of our population. And I made the comment. I don't care what your SAT score is because I don't think it has a direct correlation to your success in as in adulthood. Um, I'm more concerned that we're producing good humans. So it was never like the good humans. We're not trying to say they're not they're good humans or they're bad humans. It was more of like a quoted like it's a good human goal because that's our goal is that we're producing 
good citizens in society, people who care about each other, who have empathy, who volunteer in their community, who show up for their friends, like those kind of characteristic traits. We're not labeling kids good or bad. No. Yeah. No, I'm not going to say it's a big high macro level too, but you don't, you don't get to see those And we don't see those kids as even that either. That's important. That's why the whole paper is being just clarified. This is really powerful to see. I mean, just this little bit. And from what I understand, this kind of data regarding school-aged children is projected to go down no matter where you are because of COVID and, you know, lockdowns and remote learning and stuff. Um, what I'm hearing from people and counselors is that children are kind of two years behind uh, socially and emotionally than they would have been. Is that right? Yes. We, we actually, I was excited when we got this data that we actually trended down for the kids asking for help. Because that, that kind of goes counter-correct with that national trend that kids are escalating and needing help. I was proud that we were at 21.2 a year ago. It was only 17.2. 17.2 is a lot of kids. Take 23,000 kids. 17 is a lot of kids that are still asking for help. But then national data is trending up. So I was proud of it. It's one year doesn't make a trend, but it's something that you keep paying attention to. But I think that's a credit to a lot of the work Jamie and her team is doing to keep it. Moving into the kids who need it. Keep, keep doing what the kids need it. Go back for kids need it. I was kind of open my very spring way. Um, I just have a question. I know data around math and test scores is different. It's not data attached to personal kids with individual issues. Is there a way that we've built this data to not lose sight of who these kids are? I, I would hate to to pull a lot of data and not be able to to say we know with what kid, what classroom, who this kid, because because this is a lot of really heavy, impactful data. Knowing that suicide happens in elementary school, that's that's a real life thing, and to put a heartbeat behind these numbers and to say, not only are we pulling this data, but we have built in processes to track that kid down so that that kid doesn't get lost and forgotten. You're only seeing the macro. The, cool. the fact that cool. we can give you this data is proof to us that we can get all the way down. And Great. We, the least important report, at least the important thing we do with the data is share with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not being rude. No, that's that's what I want to hear. It's like this is great. This is the high level, but I know those seven kids. I know what classroom they're in. I not only do I know that we've interventioned, but we've also followed up and we're also tracking those kids so that they're not on this list in the third quarter or fourth quarter when we do the other assessments. But that's why yeah. I, but I want to say just just in like policy governance chair or whatever, like when you set goals like this. It makes the rest of the organization chase this. Yeah. And that's what's cool. Yep. Right? Like and I, I think that's 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 leadership. Now you don't know all the things that Jamie and all the people on the team and all the counselors every process that they do, but like it matters, right? Yep. So I you, you get to decide what's important. I think that's good on you guys. And and I think I think you cashed that <laughs> to their this is the macro view, right? But Jamie and your team know exactly which kids comprise the 17.2 percent that said they need help they they know who they are what building they're in what classroom they're in the example she gave which the because of thinking about harming themselves they pulled those kids in because they know who that was very different than that was the old survey we did it was anonymous yeah that was terrible yeah and that's yeah, the next survey we got that list of kids who wanted to yeah. harm themselves you know who they were yeah so and that's why we, we have been pushing that whole child needs assessment. We have to keep working on making sure whatever that is, that make it not, not controversial, but every kid takes it. Because I don't, I don't want the anonymity for that. Frankly. I'd rather yeah. interview kids go, oh, you're okay? Well, good. That's good. fine. Oh, you lie? You don't do that? That's fine. Right? Yeah. Like, because the anonymous one, we would get the same trend data and something like this from ACYI, which was really cool. But we got that many kids want to harm themselves? I sure hope we know who they are, right? Yes. I think this is a powerful thing that as a parent, not not just as a, as a school board member, but as a parent, it's really a unique characteristic in a school district to find a school district 
chase these things and to say, we know, um, cause, cause some kids aren't going to tell their parents what they're going to, what they're going to fill out a survey or what they're going to tell their friends or what they're going to tell their counselor or what they're going to tell their teacher. And it, it's just, it's, I don't know how maybe, you know, we, we chase this in terms of look what the school district is doing well. Like not only do we have great graduation rates, but we also know which kids with a heartbeat and a name and an address are struggling and we chase them because they matter. I agree. Um, I just from what I've seen, there's a lot of confusion about what the whole needs assessment is. And there's a lot of parents who are upset that their child is taking it or want them to opt out. But I think if parents understand the real goal behind this, I think maybe they'll be more behind it. You know. So there are some updates being done. So part of the part of the the, the challenge is that with with little kids, right? Part of it has to be read and make sure they understand. It has to have some fidelity behind it. So some of those questions are hard to to learn and ask in, in those ways. Um, and then the you know the third and fifth graders think they still need some help. So some of it is in how we administer it. Some of it is also in the the term assessment, right? So we're not testing those things. We're asking if we can be help, right? And so the way some of those questions are organized, and so there is some revisions happening to both. The SDL assessment, which was first to align that more across the the, the um, backwards planning that from from the frames and all the goals that we have, and then the needs assessment, the team is revisiting some of those questions, especially those K two questions, the three five um, somewhat, and then middle school, high school, not not really where we have as many problems. Um, I think where we where we kind of run into some of the pieces is that. Just because your kid isn't experiencing this doesn't mean that we don't have others within those 23,000 that are. And so it, it's really a, a way for us to know like this is the group of kids that we need to support in this, whatever this is, and then give them that. And, and we don't have any way to do that globally in a school unless we have something like this. Right? Otherwise, that relies on every teacher to ask every kid those questions and then monitor that themselves. And that's, that's kind of unrealistic way to do that. And so I think as we continue to chase it and continue to get feedback from schools um, on how to make it better, we'll see um, a higher participation rate um, in schools giving it and, and parents allowing it to happen. Um, but it's just the message is really hard to get out to even our people, right? Let alone parents and all and all, right? Um, and so they, they are inundated with assessments between all of the everything that's required. Um, and so just seeing the <laughs> seeing the value in this, and again, like we do have schools who are able to say, this is the kids we know that need help, that have a picture of the kid on the wall who doesn't have a trusted adult. Like, look guys, this whole staff doesn't know this kid. How do we make sure that they feel welcome in our school? Um, and it, it ties to a lot of our other data. And, and it, there is connections um, to other things that we'd like to connect, such as our secondary kids being on track or not. If we have a higher percentage of kids on track and fewer of them attending school regularly. Probably because we've learned a lot of things in COVID that you can do some things outside of the classroom. And so there's, you know, so there's some different things that we're looking at, but really just trying to get the message out of the needs assessment. It's been a challenge. Um, and to, to understand what the purpose is and then how the data is used, it's really important. And it is driving, hopefully, and will drive more in the future, how resources are allocated to schools because that higher at risk score should also be support right um, but right now that's that's difficult because we're having a hard time uh, with the participation so i think um i mean i know you're not through your report yet but i think um with this that's one of the challenges and i think that um, you can connect with janelle on too is how can we get the community to understand this isn't this isn't about getting into privacy it's about helping kids and um that mental health aspect of it, I think, would be a good thing. Uh, community saying we need more mental health in schools. Well, here's a way that we can try to guide our money and um, guide our resources. And I think even if our data is not showing exactly what you want, we're taking on the big audacious goal that other school districts aren't even trying. So thank you for, you know, throwing things at the wall and seeing what's sticking and refining the resource in the process of going through it over and over again. And this has saved lives already. So keep that in mind. I mean, sometimes getting these, this data together and looking at it can be difficult, but it is making a difference for our kids. And uh, we need to be able to share those stories to help um, 
all the parents go, oh, yeah, I understand that this may be one of those things that I may not want, but this could help my kid. And maybe they'll say something that I'm not, they're not ready to tell me. So well, if, you, yeah. you're, if you're a parent, you're thinking, man, my kid, my kid's in stress. 17% of our kids are. At least you're, you're not alone. Like the, the, there's there's normal scenes on that too. The last last uh, piece of the report is that eight percent of our school district managed schools have a the compass rating on a twenty seven day school's climate culture. And remember, part of that climate culture attributes to the dashboard encourages the staff survey, the parent survey, the common assessment needs assessment survey, the attendance, the behavior, and and the reason we want all that is, is just the health and wellness of, of a community being able to handle these things in the school, right? The staff believes in each other, the parents that are around the school and feel good about the school. The more more buzz around that, the, the better we feel we're able to take that on, take on these challenges. And so this, this is that data. You can see the denotations of pluses and minuses. Again, schools go up, schools go down. You had a run report last week about parent input and not turning in surveys, right? This is where they're hurt by not turning in your survey. That's back to the dashboard. I think one of the schools you asked about, you can see you might want to get more parent participation <laughs> in doing that because it does it does hurt the, the score of the school. Um, and then this one, when you get down to the data and analytics of it, I do report compliance. Eighty-three point eight three percent of our district grade schools are at the composite. Helps level getting higher. Are those uh, climate? Uh, how many different languages are those climate surveys in? We, you know, I think if we translate those to, I think every language that they they have, and mm -hmm. Google translate that to any language they need that. I, I think we can do that, but I don't know if the parents. I don't know if there might be a blocker that the parents may not be um, might not go to ask. So with those kind of language things, um, how can we bridge those barriers so that we can get more um, more of those climate cultures in different languages to the parents that need them? The other thing with, with this is parents of kids in multiple schools. I would fill it out one time, right? But what happens is that one school gets your feedback. And the others do not, and so that's probably something I, I wouldn't think about. Oh, I did it one time. I'll do it for all seven. And that could be something that communications could work on too. If you have if you have kids in multiple schools, we really need you to fill it out for each school because you you may have one kid that's succeeding in elementary, and the middle school might be a problem. So, copy and pasting both answers may not give us what we can do to help your child um, best succeed. So yeah, it may take a little bit longer, but the results will be worth it in the end. And just trying to get that. How can we communicate to the community better of why we're doing this and how it helps us and how it will help you and your student? Well, and it's also fun to keep showing you the dashboard because I, I know the first few times we presented it, it's like overwhelming and confusing. And I'm like, what in the heck is this? It started, I can tell it started to make sense to you now. Like, it's one core score with a lot of metrics that matter to us all into one. And we work with all of them. And all of them, ironically, represent things you, you care about as a board. So they're not ironic. One minor detail term very should be a plus five. Uh, but uh, again, what I'm sorry. Uh, what meant. President Pedrovsky really pointed out is this really, for me, was. Uh, and I wouldn't call it an assessment, I call it a snapshot, but it's painting a picture that we really need uh, mental health support in our elementary schools. Because uh, I'm seeing a lot of that. It, those numbers are were, were higher than I, I expected to see. I, I, would, I didn't expect to see the struggles or the, the, the discontent or even, you know, the, the need from our elementary kids where you kind of think that that's where school should be so much fun and should be just enjoyable but i see in those numbers that uh that and you hear it from the legislature too we need more mental health support in all of our grades uh, not just as they transition to get to the older that's maybe we can intervene a little earlier in, in the elementary kids that maybe we can change some of that but uh I, again i don't mind i know you would like to get it to one number but i don't mind looking at some of these categories 
separately because they're different pictures, you know. Uh, the attendance, you're right, they may not be there, but they could be showing proficiency, they could be showing that they're getting the material. Uh, you know, maybe they're having uh, personal struggles at home or something else that, that's affecting that ability to, to make it there to school, either on time or, or, or regularly, or maybe they're having to support the other parts of the family. So, but proficiency is, is another score that I, I want to see, you know, so it's, I know you want to break it down to one number. I'm okay with having multiple numbers. And, and, and maybe if, if we struggle with the parents, maybe they can be a box they could check that they say they have students in multiple schools and we can understand that they're basically doing an average of all their kids together rather than making them fill out a form for each school uh, just to, to encourage more participation. Thank you. Maybe in that pull down, you can have all the basic information the same. And then if you have students in multiple uh, schools, please check which school and then you can have some um, maybe other pull down boxes that might go from there. I don't know. I'm just looking at her. You know what he's saying? You just I'm, 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 just, I'm not the guy. I'm going to have some of those. Yeah. yeah. I'm repeating okay. You know what he's saying? Because I'm like, I'm going to turn it right down, down on the note. Yeah, like in some of those surveys, do you do drugs? If you hit no, then it skips the other questions. But if you have like multiple students, if you click yes, okay, which schools? And then it can kind of break down into there. So that way they may not have to fill out the whole thing again, but you can still get some more of that. I just want to say kudos. I mean, this is, yeah, it's a lot of data and it's a lot of push, but um, the more we do this, um, maybe our goals are changed. Maybe what we're tracking may not be exactly what we're looking for, but as we do this, it's going to get more refined. And I just, I think it's something that we're doing the right thing for the right reasons. Maybe if the data doesn't always show it in the right way, we are reaching the students that need it. And it's a, and it's a good place to start. And as we keep doing this, we're going to get better at it. And we're going to know how to do it. So thank you very much for this. Thank you for all your work in it. Craig, Craig, I want to. I have one last question on yeah. the table about. I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Maybe you guys read it differently, or you have more data to read. So the table where I asked about um, students asking for help. So we want the number to go down. Is that yes? Okay, but is there a way to tell? Like, is it going down because they don't need help, or is it going down because they're not asking for help? Giddy. It could be multiple reasons. So it may not be representative of the same kids, which is part of the data that we're trying to get, right? Across it could be that they've already received the help they needed, right? But mm -hmm. it could be that it was just a temporary glitch in what was going on. Or it could be that they said, I didn't get help for that, so I'm just not getting something. Yeah, a lot of things. But I guess from that question, you guys would be able to source out. Right. And there are, there's a priority level on the questions behind the scene. So counselors and, and staff know that when we get these back, we have a list of priority questions that have to be dealt with today, which which is why we help them figure out how to spread it out. You can't respond to 1,700 kids in the high school in one day because what if 700 of them tell us there's something right now? So they give part of the time for that reason. So the counselors can respond to that group and then triage and move on, <clears throat> and then they'll give it some more. Um, and, and the counselors are spending a lot of time on those high priority questions, which is great. But we also have this group of kids, which these kids sitting here tonight spoke about, right? Not this 2% and not this 2%, but this group who are saying, I'd really like some help, but it's not an urgent. Well, counselors are dealing with this because it's so high priority. And oftentimes that middle group is exactly what the kids identify. Right? They're exactly right. It's that group of kids who are like, I would like help, but. Sounds. And if it's a large swath of, hey, I'd like some help, but it's not urgent, that can maybe be addressed in in a class as just teaching to the whole of, hey, here's some skills that can help you get through this. And so you can adjust that way too. So some of that's yeah. being done in advisory, right? Or whatever it's called it. Before. And then some of that's being done in groups with counselors, right? So one to one to one to one, bringing kids together and all have a similar concern and helping them with those things. We, there's the elephant in the room, and we're we're eating it one bite at a time. So um, that's great. All the different ways of helping the kids. Thank you. Yeah, it's a snapshot. Yeah. Uh, every year, your picture is not the best, but hopefully, as you go along, the picture group looks better and better. I got some embarrassing pictures from kindergarten and first grade, but <laughs> they got better. So hopefully, like I said, each year as we make these assessments, we can watch them, track them. Watch them get better. That's what this whole thing is, is allowing you to do. So therefore, 
I would like to make a motion. Okay. I would move to accept. Oh. Okay. I would move to accept the expectations of the board report for Global Goals 1.4 Schools Social and Emotional Learning Dashboard. Could you, as in a reasonable interpretation of the executive limitation? Right here, a second. Second. And it's a move by Director Green and second by Director Thornton. Could I get a roll call, please? Director Conlon. Aye. Of course. Director Green. Thank you. Director Petrowski. Aye. Director Thomas. Aye. Director Thornton. Aye. Director Rizzo. Aye. Director Worth. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amy, Will, I would not be surprised in the next few years if there's going to be districts coming and asking us and you're going to be presenting on this at some things. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So let's see what we can do to trademark this and bring some more money in <laughs> to pay for more counselors. <laughs> Moving on. Um, the Human Resource Officer Michael Clow will present expectations of the board report 3.G compensation and benefits. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Good evening. At first, I uh, want to thank Campbell, Sheriff Primus, Stacy Yasumoto, Zach Gonzalez, Lori Martin, and Amy Pippen for their support preparing this report. I'm just going to go through the sections because there's one section in particular I want to. Highlight uh, superintendent will not cause or allow jeopardy to the organization's fiscal integrity or public image when dealing with employment compensation benefits, employees, consultants, or contractors that report compliance. Superintendent will not change his or her own compensation or benefits that report compliance. Superintendent will not promise or imply anything other than at will employment except that designated classified and certified employees that report compliance. Superintendent will not establish current compensation and benefits that deviate material from the geographic and or professional market value that's employed. Um, last year, we were unable to move forward and plan to fully move certified and exempt staff into our target market range. Therefore, I report um, non Take any questions. Um, person, oh, uh, this is just a question for um, kind of thinking ahead for next year. Do you know how you're going to report the um, the mill levy sections into this compensation? Uh, so it's not a total general kind of. Do you think about that of showing the difference between the bill of the override versus the general budget in there? Mm -hmm. uh, just it's clear, um, it's clear to our taxpayers that, that money is being spent there and there and there, so to speak. Sure. And I mean, I'm, we moved closer to that market rate that Richard, that market area that we are, but how much did the recent um, announcements of different school districts kind of thwart our efforts? It's it's a moving target every year. And I, I think if, if we had done those two mechanisms, we had the money to do those mechanisms last year, we would have reported compliance because we enacted, we took steps to meet that target. Then the next year you learn about what the new resetting is. So every year is a new year in that sense, and that wouldn't necessarily put us out of compliance, the fact that others gave bigger rates, because we don't know going into it if that's the case. Uh, and we know this year again, we have outliers that are really driving ahead uh, on special compensation. Uh, it's a, it's a challenging environment for every position, every department, every organization um, related to attracting and retaining talent. 
we still have 3.5 percent thereabouts on employment. So we're at full employment. People who want to work are working, and we're all competing with each other for the talent that's out there. We feel that not only on the teacher side, but on the party side too, in terms of programmers and bus drivers and pairs. And, it's a challenging environment for everybody. Has the shortage in bus drivers and some of those things that were really in high demand about a year or so ago, are we still having the same demands or how did they like that a little bit? Or? No, absolutely. That's why we have a wait list in the transportation park. 15 to 20 drivers would be my current estimate. And that's the other piece is how do you cherry pick? Your compensation practices, our philosophy has been we lift all boats together because the challenge is across the system. Spectators, um, math teachers, uh, it's it's a challenging environment. Uh, accountants, um, and we can't cherry pick. You can't delineate what our hard performance issues are. We just got to keep moving our purpose. We've got to keep great culture. And uh, we've got to keep moving compensation as a whole as best we can each year. And it's like I can tell you, it's a priority uh, for executive leadership, for superintendent, for my colleagues. Well, it's moving in the right direction. Right? It's going up. It's going up. It's trending right with the middle money. money. But I can't see on there how this is affecting our teachers' salaries. It doesn't specify teachers. Right. Teach, I can speak to that specifically, and I can always share salary schedules and that sort of thing with the board. Um, 10%, teachers got a 10% raise last year. We had a 5% base raise to all three groups, which is a historic high for us. We, can, we can't think of that alone. And that wasn't enough. We added uh, certified staff into that um, adjustment rotation. We did half of what we targeted, which was an additional 5%. We were targeting an additional 10% for teachers to try to bring them to market. And that's just it's a really challenging number um, for us to chase. So teachers effectively had a 10% raise last year, which is, that's unheard of in, in uh, our world. Do we have projections on how the bill is going to affect yourself? Yes, we've, we've um, uh, done that preliminary work with the teachers union. So uh, 47977 is that first hit when we add um, no levy, it's 4,900 to the base. So we worked with our um, teachers union. We worked with BDA closely on this. We did a flat dollar amount, which moves that front end um, further along. The sacrifice on the back end a little bit, depending on how you look at it, but we have a great relationship. Work that together to try to move that front end. And then we'll, we have negotiations um, related to save money and Enrollment increases that we'll do the strength related to that additional compensation on top of that. So these are these two years will be historic compensation as to all groups. I'm to quantify that for you. So Michael just shared the certified staff received a 10% raise effectively last year. The $4,900 that we announced into the salary schedule of the base in December is another 11.3% to the base. So that's a, that's a 21, almost a 21.4% increase in the base since a year and a half ago. And we do have money set aside for additional compensation. We're in the process of doing that right now. But again, the whole world moves. So here's my really bad analogy for us. Unless it's a sled dog analogy. Unless you're the lead dog, the view never changes, right? We're always chasing, chasing, chasing. But think about that 10% last year through the negotiations, the mill levy, another 11.3% bump to the base. And I, and I won't speak to where I think we'll be because we'll get through negotiations, but there'll be more to come um, for certified staff. And we'll, we'll still be behind some of our neighbors. I know we're moving in the right direction, and I think that's good. This might be something to um, the association may think about too. There's the balance of we've been so low for pay for a while, and now it's starting to go up. When do we start to maybe address some of those um, other things on the plate as the salary starts to go? How much do we increase compared to how many more we hire to 
reduce class sizes a bit. So there isn't um, 35 kids in a class and maybe we're at 27. I mean, that may be a long way that we have enough room to have those other classes. I'm thinking ahead and maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but as we go on, because the stress of 35 kids in the classroom doing all those report cards to 27, more time, those kids to help with that. It's a balance. It's a balance game that some of the other districts don't have to play because the salaries are already up there and they can kind of do that. But I, I know as we start we can go in that direction, that might be something to maybe ask the uh, members. Okay, as we're going up, I mean, it may not be going up enough right away, but how are these other things doing there? Is this something that we need to look at too? If, if we can hire more teachers, we have the shortage too. <laughs> Could we hire more? Maybe instead of going up 10%, do we go up eight and hire a little bit more to try to take some of that stuff off? I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not saying that's the perfect thing. I just worry about there's so much on teachers' plates to get rid of some of that stress too, because it is a mental health versus money balance and that too. Um, I don't think it's gonna have it right now, but just keep that in the back of our minds as we try to keep and retain the teachers that we have. How do we make sure that we're not giving them the mental burden where they just want to quit too, so. I can talk a little bit about our biodynamic history with the different levels of where we stand currently. So the board's cut up. High school biodynamic, the middle school biodynamic, the last one that's left is elementary. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, just in terms of recovery, we have made moves over the years. Well, we've added, um, we've added DE and positions. Uh, we've recovered high school and middle school in terms of the ratio from pre-2010. Uh, elementary still sitting out there, but like you like you described, it's a trade. Everything's a trade. Um, do we do we want more plumbers to serve schools, or do we want to pay subs more? We want to pay staff more. We want to um, impact class sizes. That's a that's a tricky balance. What we have in mind in executive leadership is that we have an effective eight percent inflation rate going out there. So if we don't get healthy raises. Uh, our staff effectively are taking a pay cut. And we've got to be mindful of that in this environment. Got to, not only is it competitive for talent, but we just want to make sure people um, maintain their base. Workforce. So those are all discussions that we have and the executive leadership takes those trades that you described mm -hmm. seriously. We have a great relationship with both of our unions. We're very lucky they work with us. We work with them and uh, we're trying to do the best we can to to make those trades um, each year. Um, just for reference, I didn't see it in here, but I could have missed it. Um, health insurance, how much could it go up this year? Uh, it's gonna, this this coming year is a five percent uh, increase, which is a it's a very good renewal again in this environment uh, with no changes to the deductible and continued increases to HSA. And I said in my report, our HSA is unmatched in the market. So that's money that people, that is effective. That's real income that folks will keep with them for life. That doesn't come back to us. That doesn't end. That doesn't we don't cover that. The district is uh, putting it into an individual's account that, that they own. So it's still expensive. It's still expensive for families. We, we recognize that they're just not good answers. There are trades to be made related to those issues as well. But it's a good renewal, it's 5%. We're back to where we were. We had a, a couple of tough years for it. It was a little edgy out for us. I've heard some other districts are close to a 10 to 12% increase for their health insurance this year. So glad the health and wellness that we're doing and trying to keep that down, whatever we can. So thank you for that. Um, it's, it's a tough balance for sure. And we have a committee, we have a committee that reviews that, that's not me, that involves teachers, staff, administrators, that brings those recommendations to superintendent and executive leadership. And uh, it's just part of course that we take care of those benefits. Those recommendations are accepted year over year over year. Um, so there's strong, complete voice in those decisions. I have a motion. Uh, see. Okay, I, it's our turn. Okay. 
Um, I move to accept the expectation of the board report through 3G compensation and benefits as conveying reasonable interpretation of the executive limitations. Do I hear a second? I second. Your next so moved by Director Thomas, seconded by Director Lino. Could I get a roll call, please? Director Conrad. Aye. Director Conrad. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Director Petrowski. Aye. Director Thomas. Aye. Director Thornton. Aye. Director Rita. Aye. I heard you. Thank you. Director Worry. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Michael. Um, policy review. Um, April 26th, uh, we'll have asset protection, and May 24th, we'll have treatment of students in public. Um, that May 24th meeting, there is discussions because that is the middle of our um, graduation weeks, of maybe moving it to the May 10th linkage or moving it to uh, back a week so it's on the fifth week or we could leave it where it is, but that makes a very long week with all the graduations and stuff. And I did, yeah, two graduations and then that. So um, we can decide that later, but I'm just putting that bug in your ear and kind of think about it. And um, we'll think about either the 10th or moving it. Is that the 30th or the 31st? Yeah, it, was, it would be the 31st, or we could do our fifth Tuesday meeting that is that meeting and just make it that one. So if you can kind of give us back some feedback on what they would work best and how you want to approach that, that'd be great. I think you do make it more Yeah. I like the 31st. So are you jumping in? So I was just, well, we were going down through the um, policy review, so I thought I'd just put it there. I'm sorry, I did jump ahead. My bad. My bad. I just, just putting it out there, we don't have to decide tonight. Um, sorry, just wanted to get some feedback on that. But my bad, I will stay on policy here. <laughs> All right. Um, item E, the Board, of, uh, the Board of Education will discuss policy 2.C, agenda planning, and the Board of Education 2023-2024 calendar. All right, so go ahead and pull that up. I don't know on October 31st, probably. <laughs> Understandable, I think when Lynn puts that calendar in, she just puts in the the regular dates of where it would formally line up and I would be scary. I missed that too. I'm trying to find it myself. Same thing with Valentine's Day, Mr. Green. I'm very sweet. Oh yeah. I don't have to worry. It's on page 17. Page 17. Page 17. Yeah, page 17. Thank you, Ashley. It's on the back of all the other pages. That's the reason why it's. Yeah. As has been shared, worrisome dates or Halloween. Yeah, worrisome dates or Halloween and, and Valentine's uh, Day. <laughs> Both commercial holidays, but yeah, no. <laughs> it's just, um, and remember, with the linkage meetings with the cities. Yeah. We calendar them and then let Ann work with the two cities to say, do you want to meet? Who's turns it to host? I'm not sure anyone's going to be dying to do that, but put it on the calendar to hold the date. And then on the 14th, that's that's a link that you're planning meeting. You choose to meet once in February and then business meeting on the 28th so as not to get any of us in trouble with our spouses. Or meet, invite them to come to board meeting or something. Do a linkage meeting for Valentine's Day with their linkage meeting with four spouses. Yeah. Like it's just, yeah. 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 <laughs> There'd be a lot of public comments on that one. I think the fifth Tuesday had fallen on Halloween before and everyone elected not to do that. Yeah. But yeah, but that's just how the calendar falls. So <laughs> um for right now, uh do we want to uh change the 14th day for a different day or just not go in between? Uh, sorry, February 14th, let's look at Valentine's Day. Do we just um, not have a linkage that month? Yeah, next year. Tell me the, the three of you, 
are still on the board. I have Louis Stewart. I vote yes. All four things. Even more stranger than that. Let's. Okay. Let's. Um, let's put. Um, let's cancel the 14th uh, language planning session. Uh, we can add one in at a different date. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. And then um, the October 31st, uh, joint Tuesday meeting. I think that will probably be, I know, but maybe offer a different day instead. That may hurt that you're breaking your heart. I don't know that we need to offer. Okay. I just say. Okay. All right. Any others? All right, okay. So I hear a motion. Move to approve the Board of Education 2023-2024 calendar as presented or with the with, with no with the revisions that we just voted with. No revisions. Okay, hearing that so moved by Director Worth and seconded by Director Connie. Could I get a roll call, please? And Director uh, Thornton, we canceled the February 15th Fourth as well 14. as 14, sorry, February 14th as well. The 15th is my dad's birthday, sorry. February 14th, as well as most likely the October 31st, 5th Tuesday. So those are the revisions. Director Khan. Aye. Director Kern. No. <laughs> Dr. Petrovsky. Aye. Director Thomas. Aye. Director Thornton. Aye. Director Vito. Aye. Director Ward. Aye. Motion passes by majority. Um, all right. Item F, the Board of Education will discuss policy 2.J, policy government investments. Um, go ahead and pull that up. And um, we did change it. It's been God, close to 10 years since. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Part of the reason, uh, the increase of um, item B in the training opportunity support education is really just to cover the cost of um, inflation and stuff going on with the hotels and that, but then also to cover the cost of giving more of our student advisory council members to that. So it was kind of pushing the limits and we want to make sure that we can try to get as many of our students there as possible because it's good for them. So that was the, the reason for that change. Yeah. 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 You scroll up at the bottom, it says from 12. It's, yeah. yeah. It's it coming? Yeah. Oh. Keep scrolling down. It's an there increase. There you go. Yeah. It's there an increase goes. from 12 to 20, so it'll be an $8,000 increase. And keep in mind, any of your budget that you do not use does go back to the general fund. It doesn't just sit there. So if we use the 20, right, if we don't use the 20, it goes back to the general fund, and then we just set the budget again for next year. So. Were all student advisory members given the opportunity to, like to, for example, Cassie, they're all? Everyone is invited and then they determine whether they go or not. And you guys pay for their lodging, their CASB registration, the food that's down there, the chaperones, everything. Yep. And we're taking more students down there than we used to, which is, which is a good thing. So. CASB caps it at, I think, eight. And we always, I always push that a little bit because um, Eagle Ridge Academy is a member underneath us, and some of our students on the Student Advisory Board, board is Eagle Ridge. And so I always push that. So any student that wants to go really has the opportunity to go that um, it gives us a well, because, because they're an associate member and it's kind of based on the enrollment, but yeah, I've never had them ever say, no, you can't. I just register everybody that wants to go. And if they ever have a pushback, then I always say, Eagle Ridge, that, that works well for and, and I would just say, practically speaking, we invite all the kids uh, to participate with the, with the understanding that we may have limited seats. We offer that to the, to the oldest students, right? So that they haven't had a chance to go. We've never had think about we've not had a student who said they'd like to go, be unable to go because of space. 
And remember who these students are. They're really they're busy, right? So it's much like you. They've got to commit to that to that travel and that event and that conference. It's just I can't say it won't ever happen. But so far, every student that's expressed an interest to go and is able to attend has been able to attend. Um, because again, they're they're juggling multiple things. They're all in lots of things, and it's a time commitment. But they sometimes, well, so far, we haven't had more say they want to go than we can take. So would that be an exempt absence or uh, not not exempt? Uh, that is how you change the charts. I'm not sure how that charts in their report, but, it's, but I would handle that with the principal without ability to use the school activity. That email comes directly from superintendent. <laughs> Are you expecting these things to cost a lot more this year? Is that why? Yeah. Well, if you look at the current budget, it did. The, the CASB registrations went up and, and those type of things. So um, I anticipate it. And um, I just, as we know, food's going up, everything's going up. Yeah. So. Again, whatever's not in use goes back into the general budget, but it's better to have it budgeted than to change it. Um, and you look at if you look at the expenditures, there were monies and other items that were not used. So then that way, sometimes we can move those around a little bit if if need be. Lori is very flexible on that and understands that we would never not allow someone to go if we had expended the money out of the one when we have money at the other budget. So very understandable. It's you know, kids getting that opportunity to go. So as well as you. <laughs> Do I have a motion? Yes. I move to approve uh, policy 2J governance investment budget as presented. Do I have a second? I'll second. Carried and so moved by Director Thomas and seconded by Director P. Hill. Can I get a roll call, please? Director Khan. Aye. Director Green. Yeah. Director Petrosky. Yes. Director Thomas. Aye. Director Thornton. Aye. Director P. Hill. Aye. Director Worth. Aye. And thank you, uh, Director Thornton, for that nice report versus the printout that we had last year. And thank you, Lori, for your staff for creating that for us, the, the pie chart. So. All right, item 13, approval of superintendent contract. Uh, the Board of Education declared Deborah, the Deputy Superintendent Will Pierce as the finalist for 27 day school superintendent position at their February 8th, 2023 regular meeting. The Board of Education will discuss the approval of the contract between Will Pierce and 27 day schools effective July 1st, 2024 in a con um, confidential enclosure. I move to approve the contract between Will Pierce and 27 day schools for superintendent schools on this date of March 8th, 2023, and effective July 1st, 2024, as presented. Do I hear a second? Second. Hearing it, so moved by Director Thomas and seconded by Director Thornton. Is there any discussion? Wait time. Sorry. Um, hearing no discussion, could I get a roll call, please? Director Khan. Aye. Yes. Director Green, thank you. Director Petrosky. Aye. Director Thomas. Aye. Director Thornton. Aye. Director Vigil. Aye. Director Worth. Yeah, okay. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Congratulations, future superintendent. No take backs. <laughs> All right. Going on, scheduled meetings. Uh, April 12th will be our linkage group with student advisory here and uh, Texas Roadhouse with lots of butter and rolls. Yeah. Um, April 26th, our study session. Um, we'll send you some. Hi, Ronald. May 10th. May 10th will be a linkage meeting or uh, possible planning or. Um, possible move of our uh, regular board meeting. May 24th will probably be moved. Um, and May 31st may be uh, temporary of that. And then we have our May 30th Tuesday joint meeting. All right, board meeting. If, uh, 
not like they're six months. Oh, nice step. So, um, I was hoping that we get it solidified by April. Um, if everybody could just check your calendars, um, I think we're leaning more towards May 31st, if that would be all right for everyone. Um, if there isn't any issues with that, we could change our rank. Okay. I don't care. Would you be able to be? I would not be there on the 10th. So. You guys think we should work date? I'm going to get some input from Lori. So then talking about the May meeting, you have historically presented the budget to them in May for approval in June. Yes. Is with that May 10th date, you do cardiac arrest, or would you rather have them be the 31st to present and then bring back for approval in June? I think it'll be answered. But yeah, I mean, of course, I would prefer more time. And with the way the joint budget committee's going this year, we I might not even seven. know by May 10th. Yeah. Um, yeah. It would be tight windows to produce I, that document i think functionally for you and your team the 31st is a better date than to try to get that done on the 10th or being on the 24th but i know that some of you don't want it so graduation i think 31st so the main meeting is scheduled for the 24th but we also have two graduations that day so we're trying to move our May meeting to a date that's not during graduation week. Uh, well, we were looking at either the 10th because you have a Lincoln's meeting date scheduled there, or the 31st. You have we have a, we have calendar for the fifth. Uh, no, the 30th is the fifth Tuesday, but we have a fifth Wednesday that month in May, which is the 31st. It's the hundred days of May. It's graduated. It's graduated. So that's May. All seniors have done at spring break. It's the most exciting time of the year. Yes. Um, the back of that date, I I think. I think we've settled on thirty first is better. Uh, wouldn't that work okay for me? <laughs> If not, we understand it. Oh, can I call it? Oh, what? Yes. Yes. Really? Yeah. 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 You still have a jury. Is that Labor Day or is that no? No. Um, Memorial Day will actually be um, the 29th. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah. How many do we need for formal? <laughs> Four four. Yeah. Yeah. We'll move the May 24th meeting to the 31st. And still possible um, linkage or planning on these For now. For now, yes. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, 15 board meeting evaluation. Director Connell will present the quarterly meeting evaluation. All right. Governing style. Outward vision rather than focus on internal operations. I give some four. Strategic leadership proactive rather than reactive. Five. Collaborative teamwork. 4.7. <laughs> An initiator of policy and not merely a reactor to staff initiatives. Five, arrived on time for meeting. Three, because of me, I'm chronically late and I'm sorry. Um, properly prepared for meeting. Five, full attention to the meeting. Five, worked in a business like manner, maintained appropriate decorum. Five, listened to and responded to the statements of others in a respectful manner. Five, Business was conducted lawfully in an ethical manner. Five, no other comments. Thank you very much, Director Khan. And um, make sure that's filled out. Uh, closing comments. Hearing no closing comments. Again, congratulations, Will. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And I call this meeting adjourned at 9.26 p.m. Oh, my God.
Thanks for having me. So fun. You were going to miss 